Well, right now we're going through every bit of information we can to try to find the whereabouts. Amir Al Falani. I was wondering if you could help me uh, locate him. Our search has taken us all across the country. So, no problem. Thank you very much. New Haven's off the board. This is the contact information for the Goldsteins out of Boise. Are you in Boise? Mm -hmm. I got Boise. Rabbi Herschel Goldstein, is he there, please? Hello, is this Debbie? Hi, Debbie. Uh, I'm just returning your phone call regarding the Rabbi Goldstein. He's not. Okay. All right. No, no, no problem. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Boise's out. chasing down every lead we can get. But honestly, it's been a lot more difficult tracking down these guys than we thought it would be. It's really been quite an undertaking. Far more difficult than we ever imagined. Well, so far, all the leads have been dead ends, but we're hopeful that something will pan out. If not, we'll just have to keep looking. In 1976, as America still struggled with the aftermath of the Vietnam War and Watergate, a New York television station launched an innovative and groundbreaking style of talk show that would help bridge the gap between the despair of yesterday and the healing of tomorrow. Look, Watergate and Vietnam are behind us, and I think that this new president will be a breath of fresh air. We leave it to not. Russia feels that they can win this war. This may be what they think, but this is what I know. Afghanistan will be their Vietnam. Please, someone tell me how trickle-down economics has helped anyone in this country. The reaction to the show was immediate as critics and audiences agreed that Building Bridges had set a new standard by which all other talk shows would be measured. The impact of Building Bridges had a far-reaching effect that exemplified what could be accomplished through civil discourse and tolerance. Its undeniable influence would be felt for years to come. In the fall, we paid a visit to the studio where Building Bridges began. At present, the studio was being used every Saturday for a live children's show. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> this is it. Infamous Studio 1A. Studio 1A. My <laughs> goodness. What'd you find? Oh. oh. This, is the, this, wow. is the, uh, this is the table. Look at that. You know what we should do? What? I think it's difficult to put into words just how important and uh, influential Building Bridges was mm -hmm. on, on myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I know I could speak for you. Absolutely. Because we've talked about it on, on how important it was for us growing up. Mm -hmm. It was the first show that really turned me on to politics, right. foreign affairs, mm -hmm. uh, in a way that made it understandable mm -hmm. and exciting to watch. There were no celebrity guests. It was just two guys passionate about the issues of the day, talking it out and doing it with conviction and passion. There were some shows you thought they, they are not going <laughs> to be friends after this. I mean, there were times that it, it, they would like almost like come across right. the table at each other. And remember, they would pound the table every once in a while. They'd get so mad. But at the end but of every show. Every show, they would hug and, and uh, say goodnight. Again, it was, it was just such a groundbreaking show. And you know what was, what was really cool about that moment at the end of every show is that you know, when you saw them do that, you thought to yourself, well, if these two guys, you know, mm -hmm. from these different backgrounds, and having just had this heated discussion, mm -hmm. heated debate, could reach a compromise, mm -hmm. give each other a hug at the end, you know, it made you think, well, why couldn't I do that? Or why right. couldn't 
we all do that. Mm -hmm. It breaks my heart sometimes to think that, you know, future generations won't have that. Yeah, it, it was you know? it was a shame that it went off mm -hmm. the air. Right? It went yeah. for ten years. I mean, from ten years, nineteen seventy six to nineteen eighty six. Mm -hmm. Oh, and then yeah. it. That's uh, when it all. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> it all fell came apart to an end. Yeah. In July of 1986, WNET's associate producer, John Paul Burkhart, in an attempt to introduce the show to a larger mainstream audience, sent a collection of outtakes to the popular NBC show, TV's Bloopers and Practical Jokes, hosted by Dick Clark and Ed McMahon. So, my friend, before we go, I would like to wish you a very pleasant Ramadan. Uh, uh, it's Ramadan. Ramadan. Oh. Ramadan. Ramadan. No. Why can I not say this? Hold on. Wait. One minute. Is it me? It's Ramadan. I will get it. It's not Ramadan. It's not a hotel. Okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. A very pleasant Ramadan. Oh. <laughs> Something is not right here. Look. Could someone please adjust my chair? I need it a little higher. Oh, that coffee is hot! It feels like my loins are on fire! Ah, help me! Get me a bag of ice, please! <laughs> well, the problem that I have with Henry Kissinger is that... What was that? Hmm? Oh, that sound? Oh, that was the chair. These are old chairs. They, they need to be oiled. They squeak when I turn like this. No, seriously, that, that, that was not the chair. You see how squeaky it is? You cannot hear that? It's very squeaky. Yes, I know, I have the same problem at home. But I blame it on the dog. <laughs> but not everyone was laughing. Feeling hurt and humiliated, Rabbi Goldstein believed that being singled out on national television was a deliberate attempt to make him look foolish. Adding fuel to an already raging fire, Rabbi Goldstein lashed out at everyone involved with the show through a series of media appearances. <laughs> Always welcome on this show, my friend. But I gotta say, as many times you've been my guest, and we go way, way back, my friend, I've never seen you this angry. So tell me, Rabbi, what's gotten you so upset? Well, Dr. Dan, I feel this action with the bloopers is a betrayal of trust, and if betraying the trust of a friend is a joke, then I don't want to be the punchline. Mmm. Food for thought, my friend. Food for thought. Now this sounds really serious. Are we talking some kind of legal action here? As a matter of fact, Dr. Dan, my nephew who is an attorney feels that this is a clear-cut case of defamation of character and we should be heading to court any day now. Rabbi Goldstein, how do you feel about today's outcome? Well, my client and I both feel that the verdict is a travesty. And while we agree that justice was not served in the courtroom today, we do believe that on this day, David sent a message to the media, Goliath, and that message is quite clear. I'm sorry, a me message? Don't mess with the little guy! Rabbi Goldstein, how does this affect your relationship with Mr. Al Falani? Well, I think I can speak for my client when I say that this trial has been a very taxing experience, and it has taken an emotional toll on his health. My client, therefore, feels that it would be in his best interest to put this experience behind him and move forward with his life. So what does this mean for the future of building bridges? Well, what does it mean? What it means is that while my client feels that this trial is water under the bridge, he also feels that there is too much water over the bridge, making said bridge impassable. And that the, that the toll for this bridge is an emotional one. And that that emotional toll is too high. So what does that mean? It means the show is over. No more questions. Hello? Yeah, Roth here. That's right. We want $2 million. Fender Bender? Well, said Fender Bender has taken an emotional toll on my client, and that emotional toll is too high. Rabbi Goldstein and Amir Al-Falani would not speak to each other for the next 20 years. <laughs>